What's going on, guys? Meteorologist Jonathan Kegg is back with you for another episode of WeatherWise exclusively on New 6 Plus. Hurricane Milton was devastating on all fronts, from the freshwater flooding to the storm surge flooding on the coast to the straight line wind damage, but especially the tornadoes. The tornadoes we saw with Hurricane Milton were much bigger and much more long lived than what we would typically see with a landfalling tropical system and in Florida in general. Through the course of this episode, we are going to break down why Milton was such a prolific tornado producing tropical system and why these tornadoes were so much bigger and long lived than what we are used to in Florida. During the tornado outbreak brought on by Hurricane Milton while we were tracking those storms live on air with you guys, I talked about that it would be a story for another time on why this was happening. Today is the time for that story. We're going to get into the setup, how we were able to pinpoint that we actually had tornadoes on the ground just by using radar. Before we get into all that, though, just want to go over some of the dynamics and meteorological ingredients needed to create those larger tornadoes. For that, though, we're going to hop on into the studio. So when we're talking about tornadoes, one of the main components of their formation is wind shear. Now, you may have heard the pinpoint weather team talk about wind shear being detrimental to hurricanes. The opposite, though, is true for severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. So here's what we're talking about with the formation. The blue is the wind direction way above your head, several thousand feet above, 15 to 20,000 feet above your head. And then at the bottom of the ground here, you see those red dots and those arrows shooting across your screen. That is the wind direction at the surface. Notice how they are going in two different directions. That is changing of the wind with height. That is our wind shear. Now, what this wind shear in turn does, it creates a rolling motion into the atmosphere. So you see our little vortex tube, as we call it there. It is in the horizontal right now because of the changing of the winds with height. Now, when we get a thunderstorm to develop, this is when things start to get concerning because you see that horizontal rolling motion then get forced into the vertical, and then that's where we get our funnel. If the proper ingredients to get the funnel to the ground are present, then we get the tornado to develop and you see the condensation funnel make it way from the cloud to the ground and then we have our tornado in progress. All right, we are back in the WKMG Digital Weather Center. Now that we know how tornadoes develop and thrive, we're going to be able to see why this tornado outbreak brought on by Hurricane Milton was so bad. So here is the weather setup as Milton was making landfall. I want to draw your attention to the two different colored arrows that we have on the screen. We have the blue arrows. This is the wind in the upper levels of our atmosphere at about 15 to 20,000 feet above your head. The orange colored arrows, that's going to be the wind direction at the surface. So there is what we're going to be pinpointing here. Now, I want to point out a couple of things. This right here is a dip in the jet stream. That is our upper trough. This did two things. This helped to lift Milton up from the southern Gulf near the Yucatan and then steer it into the Gulf Coast of Florida, again, making landfall on Siesta Key. It did another thing, too. We talked about how this storm would weaken relatively speaking, leading up to landfall from the Category 5 monster, the powerhouse storm that we saw on satellite as it was moving up toward and north of the Yucatan, it didn't look as impressive. Again, it was a formidable storm making landfall, but certainly not the powerhouse that it was just about 24 hours before. It was because it was interacting with this dip in the jet stream. It was interacting with this trough here. It was inducing wind shear on the storm. So it was weakening the storm as a whole, especially on the southern side. Again, the southern side, the whole southern eye wall almost completely collapsed and all of the weather, if you will, was hanging right around the center and then to the north of it. That's why we saw the biggest flooding and the heaviest rain right along and north of the I-4 corridor. So while that was was happening, we were seeing the extra wind shear, those strong southwesterly winds brought on by that dip in the jet stream really increase across the Florida Peninsula. Now, at the same time, because around areas of low pressure, which hurricanes are, we have counterclockwise winds at the surface. So that is why the orange arrows, again, the wind at the surface level, were out of the southeast. So there's the crisscross here, southwest over southeast, that induces that rolling motion that we were looking at when we were back in the studio, that thunderstorms, when they get going, can flip from the horizontal into the vertical. And when those outer bands of Milton came through, creating those bigger thunderstorms, that's why there were so many rotating, and not just rotating, producing 
big time tornadoes. Sometimes the tornadoes you don't see unless you're in Oklahoma or in some of the deep south tornado outbreaks that we've seen recently. Certainly it was a very remarkable, no doubt historic tornado outbreak that unfortunately took lives and did a lot of damage. Again, it was a weird hurricane in a, a bunch of different ways. We've talked about the track on how it moved from west to east, but it was also weird in the sense that it was undergoing its extra tropical development as it was making landfall. Again, it didn't really look like your textbook hurricane. And again, that's because it was feeling the influence of that dip in the jet stream, but it was that dip in the jet stream combined with Milton that made the hurricane's outbreak of tornadoes so devastating. One of the most sobering things as a meteorologist is seeing a tornado debris signature on radar and not being able to do anything about it, knowing that there is a tornado in progress heading towards a town. Chief Meteorologist Candace Campos, Meteorologist Julie Broughton, Samara Kokinos, and myself we're with you guys, unfortunately, pinpointing several debris signatures indicating that we had tornadoes in progress in central Florida. Radar technology has improved so much over the last decade that now we don't need to have a law enforcement officer, a storm chaser, report that there is a tornado actually on the ground. We can detect that with radar now. That does give us a much better opportunity to give you guys a heads up. Certainly, it's hard to see on radar, but that technology allows for more advanced warning. We're going to talk about what the radar is looking at, what the radar is looking for, and what we're actually dissecting. So before we get into some of the radar technology and how that works, I want to take you back to Wednesday afternoon when we were pinpointing these tornadoes and just kind of show you what we were looking at and how we were able to dissect what was going on in real time without ground confirmation from a storm spot or anything like that. So what I have here is the four panel with the traditional radar that is in the upper left hand corner that's the reflectivity as we call it to the right of that in the upper square of our brady bunch uh, square panel here that is a fancy rotation detector that the computer kind of takes out the noise of the next panel that i'm going to show you and just plots it as straight up wind shear so the higher the color there as you start to get into the darker greens the rust colors and the yellow that's the stronger the rotation being detected again by the computer the bottom Bottom is going to be the bottom left. That is going to be the storm relative velocity. So that is where we see the reds and the greens. The red is the wind blowing away from the radar. The green is the wind blowing toward the radar. And when they're butted up against each other, which you're about to see in just one second, that's what we call a tornado vortex signature. That is where we have some extremely tight rotation, as we call it. And then the potential is going to be there to produce a tornado. And then on the bottom right, is the debris detector. The fancy scientific word for this is correlation coefficient. And we're going to talk much more about this coming up, but essentially the radar is looking at what is actually in the cloud by sending out a couple of different radar beams. And if it's highly correlated, you're going to see it come into that purple color. So if it's running into raindrops, it's going to be all pretty much one color. If it's running into hail, which could be different sizes, that color will be a little lighter, sometimes the yellow or the greens. If it's really running into irregularly shaped objects, like debris in this case, then you start to see the bright blue and gray colors coming out, meaning that the objects in the cloud are not highly correlated and that there's something else other than rain in there. And then using all of these panels together, we can determine what is actually going on there. So we're going to pick this up at about 3.13 in the afternoon on Wednesday. We are just to the north of Yeehaw Junction in Indian River County, very, very close to the Brevard County line. I'm going to pull out the telestrator here. Here is Yeehaw Junction for reference. That's the Osceola line. This is the Brevard County line. Here is Brevard County. And then uh, this is our supercell in question. So this is all ready to us just from a reflectivity traditional radar standpoint, this is looking concerning because we have the iconic hook echo as we call it there because it looks like a hook. So then a couple of different things, and it's very nice that we have this four panel here because we can then dissect, dissect everything together in real time. So the first thing, okay, that looks concerning. Then you want to check it out with your storm relative velocity, and I have the circle right there, and you see the reds and greens close together. Maybe getting a little bit of a debris signature right there 
and it's in that right area. So you're, you're going to see me um, draw a bunch of circles on here going forward, but they all need to be matching up together to success successfully identify a tornado debris signature. So let me clear this uh, back out, and then we are going to advance this in ju uh, over just a little bit of time here. Notice what just happened. So as we take a closer look here as it crosses into Brevard County, our couplet, as we call it, down here got much, much tighter. There it is right there. So now we have our tornado vortex signature. We really have a pronounced hook. And unfortunately, you see those lighter colors? You see the yellow down there? That is now the radar picking up on potential and likely debris. And then we have a debris ball is what we call it when you can see that bright red form where it's not really supposed to form. This is what we would call the forward flank downdraft. That's where all the junk of the storm is, the rain, the hail, if there's going to be rain. It's going to be in that portion. That's where that should be red and purple. Should not have that at that at that point in time. So we've already seen the, the secondary component. And then watch what happens. And then this is what I was talking about before about being sobering. So as we take a closer look here, here's all the streets. There's obviously people living here. Now watch what happens as we take this forward in time just a little bit. It becomes much more pronounced. And now we have a distinct tornado debris signature popping up. So here we have the debris ball. That's where the tornado would be. That matches up with that tornado vortex signature there and the bright red and green tightly packed. And then you see that blue color in the panel right down to the bottom right. That is the tornado uh, debris signature. So there we can confirm because we see the hook, we see where the rotation is, and now we have that very low correlation coefficient showing up. That is exactly where we have the debris. We'll take that out further. And unfortunately, again, this is when it's really serious. You know that it just went through people's homes, trees, things like that, because where we have this big, bright lavender color right there, right around 10 Mile Road, uh, strong tornado vortex signature. And again, that is what you would call top left. That is your debris ball. And then right down into the bottom side of the radar here, that is where we have the tornado debris signature in bright blue. And again, that is what you never want to see. And unfortunately, we saw that several times. And again, this is as it was crossing in to extreme uh, eastern Osceola County. It crossed the Brevard line at times. But again, that was a very, very powerful tornado. We saw the debris signature as well. Uh, we got on as we uh, were looking toward the Cocoa Beach tornado. We'll fast forward closer to 6 o'clock when we had that. And you can see here as well that we had some very, very mean supercells off the coast. One there, one there. You see the hook. One there, one there. And then these continued to progressively work their way further inland. And then this is where we had the tornado warning pop up for Coco. We'll take that further in into Coco Beach. And then you see the supercell thunderstorm work its way through. And then there is the debris signature that's going to match up with after it crossed A1A and North um, and the towns there where we saw that damage. So that was at, that's how we were able to, again, without getting ground truth, be able to confirm a tornado. And I know there's the difference between the Doppler indicated every tornado warning is serious. But as you saw, if you were watching our coverage, we had a bump, bunch of those purple blinking boxes. And that's, again, the indication that we have a confirmed tornado. That should be the heightened level of awareness. So now that we've dissected a, a, what we were actually showing you during the tornado event brought on by Hurricane Kane Milton. I want to get into some of the science and meteorology from the radar perspective on how that technology works.
Point blank, radars help keep us keep you safe, at least keep you ahead of what is coming. It's an extremely critical tool in the meteorology field. And we're going to give you a crash course on how this works. So a couple of things here. You see clearly we have the thunderstorm on screen. Then we have the radar tower in the bottom left-hand side of the second bigger box there. So what's going on is that the radar transmits the signal. It runs into something, and then it comes back to the radar tower. You may have seen them. It's these big golf ball-looking things around the state. Typically at the National Weather Service site, we have our closest one from the National Weather Service in Melbourne. So it's this call and then the reception of that signal that is transmitted by the radar. So then when it runs into a, ra uh, a raindrop, the radar then tracks the shape and the location of the object and then comes back to the radar screen. If it is a hailstone on that reflectivity section that I showed you earlier in the show, that's when it would appear that big, bright purple color because it's running into ice and it bounces back a little bit harder. Remember the reds and greens that I was showing you? Again, when it looks like Christmas on radar, I always say it's not a good thing. So the radar can actually track whether that raindrop or whatever is in the storm, the direction that it's moving, and that's how we can see the rotation. When it is green on that radar screen, that is the raindrop and the wind blowing toward the radar. When it is red, that is the raindrop or the object or the wind blowing away from the radar. And when they are close by, that's where we have that circulation that we can detect on radar to know that we have a potentially tornadic situation developing at that given time. So again, radar can not only dissect what is going on, whether it's rain or hail, it can also determine the motion that it's going to help us determine if there could be a tornado in play. All right, so here we go. This is the relatively new technology. So what we were kind of looking at before was the left, your plain old Doppler radar, that it sends a, a horizontal pulse and it can detect, okay, where the storm is moving to, okay, how heavy the rain is, maybe if there's hail in there. But as at about 2013, so a little more than 10 years ago now, we started to get the radar technology called dual polarization or dual pool for short. And I was mentioning earlier in the last segment that this is, uh, it's sending out two beams, one in the horizontal and then one in the vertical to give us kind of a 3D cross section of the hydrometeor, as we call it, the fancy meteorological term, the raindrop, the hailstone, whatever is in there to kind of distinguish what it is. And again, with that secondary beam, that dual polarization, we can then distinguish whether it is precipitation whether it's going to be snow versus rain, that is very vital in the northern climates to help dissect it where the rain snow line is. And then again, unfortunately, for the instance of the other day, when we were talking about the hurricane making landfall and all of the damaging tornadoes on the ground, we were able to dissect what was a meteorological target, as we call it, raindrop, snowflake, hailstone, versus a non-meteorological target, which could be birds, bugs, dust and unfortunately again with hurricane milton some of the debris there and again we showed you uh, the picture the the quad box the four box there when we saw the purple colors the highly correlated colors turn to blue after the tornado moved over streets and picked up trees and unfortunately people's homes and we call that the cc correlation coefficient dropout because that was the radar telling us hey when we're sending out these two beams, we're getting different measurements on this thing. Something's not right. And in that case, using the other storm relative velocity and the reflectivity, we knew it wasn't birds. We knew, unfortunately, it was debris. And that is why this new radar technology is so vital and really helps us determine if there's a tornado on the ground. And then we can give you a little more advanced warning.